Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, Colloquium. My name is Francesco Petruccione, and I'm still the interim director of NITEX. <laughs> a little insider joke. Today, it's a really nice, great pleasure to introduce to you the famous Professor Marco Merkley. <laughs> Marco uh, is visiting us from, uh, from Canada, but uh, <clears throat> his academic origins are in Switzerland. He did his undergraduate studies at the University, University of Lausanne. No. Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, yeah, the Ecole Polytechnique de Lausanne, yeah. And, uh, and went then for his PhD to the University of Toronto. And, <laughs> and after a few postdoctoral stages here and there, uh, he became professor of mathematics uh, at the Memorial University in St. John's, uh, Newfoundland. Yeah? And Marco is a big uh, uh, knowledgeable person in open quantum systems, <clears throat> but uh, mainly in the mathematical aspects of it, but with an eye on predicting new physical phenomena. Yeah? And Marco, we are very, very happy that you're here with us today and I'm looking forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, very graceful as always. And I've only become famous ever since I came and visited Stellenbosch. <laughs> so it's, it's very recent. So when Francesco says I'm, fa I'm famous, then he's um, a little too kind maybe. But I have been here um, uh, visiting twice already. And it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's fun to be here. And it's stimulating to be here and to talk to Francesco and his group. And there is not only science going on, but sometimes also other things. And now I'm kind of stuck, just a second. For example, um, yesterday, Francesco's group um, took me up this hill, Chapman's Peak, close to um, Cape Town. You can see, we walked up here, you can see Table Mountain here. And this was a very nice week. And being in South Africa, and this in particular here in Stellenbosch, is a great pleasure for me, for many reasons. OK. So um, I'm going to talk about open quantum systems. And as Francesco said, I, I'm sort of in between mathematics and physics, I guess. And um, I'm going to tell you some basic things about um, open quantum systems, which I believe many of you know. But if not, um, then this is a little reminder anyway. And um, what I'm really going to talk about at the end is some results that I proved and that I published. And in these papers, it's a little mathematical. But what I'm going to present here is not going to be phrased uh, very mathematically. Okay. So open quantum systems, by example, the Quabis, also known as the spin or the qubit. So um, a spin or a qubit, what is it? Well, it's a physical system that can be, when you look at it, when you measure it, either in the up position or the down position, or equivalently, it can read out a zero or a one when you measure it, and so on. So there's two degrees of freedoms. And the principles of quantum theory tell you that in this situation, to describe such a system and the state of such a system, you use a vector in C2. So it's a vector of two components, A, B, and each of these numbers, A and B, are complex numbers. And then, that's just a mathematical object, kind of, and then you have to read physics into that. And then the quantum theorist tells you that the meaning of the first component of this complex number is that if you take its modulus square, then you get, this is the probability that, that when you look at the qubit in the state psi, that, and you measure whether it's up or down, this is the probability of finding the result, the qubit is up. And b modulus square is the probability for being down. And so when you measure something, you will either measure up or down, one of the two. And so the sum of the probabilities has to add up to one. So this psi needs to be a normalized vector in this space C2. Okay. And then, of course, um, there is a dynamics. Things evolve. The qubit evolves because you, maybe you shine light on it. You make a measurement or something. And so for each time t, you have a state. So you get a function psi of t. So it's just a path in C2, if you wish. 
Okay, and then the, the big question, of course, is, well, according to what principle does this evolve? So what's the law that governs uh, Psi of T? If I have an initial condition and I look after 10 seconds, what's my Psi at 10 seconds, what is it? And the answer, as we are taught, is that, well, this is the Schrodinger equation, okay? The Schrodinger equation is a differential equation. It has the complex identity, the complex unit in front here. This h bar is Planck's constant. And then the Schrodinger equation tells you, if you take the derivative of this vector, so each component a of t and b of t is a function of t, if you take the derivative of each, then this should be equal to a matrix H applied to the to this uh, two-dimensional vector psi of t. That's the Schrodinger equation. And actually, it's interesting that there is this I showing up here. It means that in quantum theory, necessarily, you should um, uh, deal with complex numbers. Not like in classical mechanics, where things are purely real. OK? And what is this magical H? This H is a two by two matrix. Well, because this is a vector, right? And this H acts on this vector. And this H is called an operator or an observable. And it's called the Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian, this matrix, represents a physical quantity. It represents the energy. That's just what Mr. Schrodinger and company tell you. That is how it is. In fact, they say, any physical observable, like position or momentum or angular momentum or of any system, can be represented or is represented by an operator A acting on the state. Okay? And H here in the Schrodinger equation, so the generator of the dynamics, has the meaning of energy. It measures the energy. And an important thing is that quantum theory is inherently statistical. So, when you make a measurement of a quantity A, like for example the energy in a system given in a state Psi, then the outcome is random. Okay? It's random. You don't know what it will be, but this randomness happens according to a certain distribution, a distribution that is entirely um, determined by, by what your state Psi is and what kind of observable you measure. Okay? And the principles of quantum theory tell you that the average when you repeat the measurement and you get different values and you average, then this average number will be calculated like this. Apply your matrix A, which represents your observable to psi, the state. You get another psi, or you get another vector. Maybe for a spin, it's a C2. Take the inner product with the original vector. This gives a number. And that is the average of the measurement outcome. Okay? Principles of quantum theory. Okay. So let's see what happens at the average energy for the average energy of a state. Here I have the state of psi uh, at, at, at time t, psi of t. This is what I want to measure, the energy. And according to the principles of quantum theory, that's the average energy at time t. OK. What is psi of t? It's a solution of the Schrodinger equation. It can be written like this. It's the exponential of e to the i t h, where h is this energy observable. Um, that's just writing what psi of t is, solution of the Schrodinger equation. I can take this unitary group over to the other side because H, I didn't say that, but H is actually a Hermitian or self-adjoint matrix. When you take this over here in the inner product, it acquires a, minus, uh, a plus sign here. And then you can slip this operator through this operator and this guy with a plus and this guy with a sign and the exponent, they cancel each other, they become the identity, and so all that's left is just the naked H. So what you have found is that at time t, the average energy is the same as the average energy at time zero, because psi is just this psi at time t when t is equal to zero. OK, so conclusion, energy doesn't change. Well, that's boring, right? Because the Schrodinger equation apparently can only, only describe systems with conserved energy. But that's usually not what you want to observe or what you observe in a lab because you see you observe things that change, that lose energy, that gain energy, and so on. So that's not the right equation for that. The Schrodinger equation is, works for what's called closed systems, okay? Energy conserving systems. So then what's the uh, equation? 
for a system that is allowed to exchange energy with other parts and maybe never get energy back, lose energy all the time until it gets to a minimum energy and then stays there, for example. Schrodinger equation won't describe that. And so the philosophy of open systems, or at least one philosophy that you see in uh, all textbooks is this. Well, okay, um, when you have a system that is composed of many subsystems, all these little S's here, each of them could be uh, Quabis, for example, and they can all talk to each other and they can exchange energy and information and mass and whatever. This is represented by these interacting uh, lines here. Then, sure, this guy can lose energy, for example, to all the other guys, but this is a network and the whole network together is the philosophy, has to be a closed system. So, the energy of everybody together, including all the interaction energies, is conserved. But locally, if you look at this guy alone, this guy can very well lose all its energy and it's gone forever, for example. Okay, so local parts are open. They can change their energies. The global energy is conserved. So then the question is, well, what then is the equation of motion of such a local part? It's not going to be Schrodinger equation because this guy doesn't have conserved energy. And that's one of the core tasks, at least I consider it one of my core tasks. Um, I would know, given the Schrodinger equation of a global system, how can we derive the evolution equation, the effective evolution equation for local parts of it? Okay. And there is a good side to that and a bad side in terms that there is a, a, something that gets better when you reduce from a huge system that you know is conser energy conserving, when you reduce just to a part of it, you only have to describe few degrees of freedom, few coordinates, how they evolve, for example, right? That's good. It uh, reduces the complexity in terms of that you reduce the dimension of your system that you're interested in. But of course, you know, in this, in this situation here, the reduced dynamics, whatever it is of this guy, will be extremely complicated. Yes, it will only involve, let's say, the two up and down levels of this guy, but how this evolves will be extremely complicated. The equation for that will be very complicated because it has to encode everything that happens in the whole system, all the exchanges and everything has to be inc included in this reduced system. So the effective equations will become very complicated. Actually, the structure of the equations changes and the physics also changes when you go from an open to a closed system. Okay, and so, right, in this big system when we had, when it was composed of lots of small systems, um, you sort of have to ask yourself, what does it mean if I have two systems, physical system, systems, um, what does it mean for looking at the composite system? And a um, postulate of quantum theory is the following. Easy, if you have two systems, one here, one here, and this guy, is let's say a qubit, it has state space C2, this guy 2, then if you look at the composite system of a qubit register of two qubits, your Hilbert space that you should look at should be the tensor product. That's just what quantum theory tells you, that's a postulate. They don't have to be the same kind of systems. You could have here, let's say, a qubit or actually a system with n degrees of freedom, then this will be Cn or a quantum field or some, something, then you would have infinite dimensional uh, uh, vector Hilbert spaces here and here, and whatever. If this is the state space of this system and HR is the state space of the other system to the right, then the composite universe of these two has state space, which is the tensor product. And the Hamiltonians that drive the dynamics of the whole system they are composed naturally of a part, which is the system energy. Remember, the Hamiltonians represent physically the energy. So you would have a total Hamiltonian is comprised of the system energy. That's this kind of operator acting on, uh, acting on H, plus a reservoir energy. That's this kind of operator. And then there would be an interaction uh, energy, V. Imagine like a spring between, between two systems or so. So this also has to be accounted for and that's encoded in an operator V acting on the whole tensor product space. 
So typically Hamiltonians have in open systems have this form. And so the question is, now I'm trying to do what I said, knowing that the whole system is given by a Hamiltonian evolution, how do I reduce this to part of the whole system alone? Okay, so here is the wave function of the whole system, SR. S means system and R means reservoir, because that's how people call it. So you would have some initial um, normalized vector in this tensor product system reservoir state space, and then you would act with this unitary group on it, generated by the Hamiltonian. And now I'm only interested at observing something on the system alone. I'm not interested in what happens in the right system or in the reservoir. So this means I am measuring, if I take the average of a quantity of the system alone, this guy only sits on the left tensor factor here. So this now is an operator acting on the whole Hilbert space. This is a vector in this whole Hilbert space. And if I take this inner product, well, I get the average of the system observable A alone at time t. Now, you see, if you wish, this thing here is a linear map in this operator A. If I stick in here a linear combination of an A1 and an A2, well, then the answer will be linear by this construction here. And so you know that in this situation, since this is a linear map in A, there's a unique element in the dual space of operators which um, reproduces this average in this way. What this means is the following. This can be written uniquely in the following way. You take the trace over the Hilbert space of the system. You stick in your, that was very wrong. You stick in your um, observable here. There is one and exactly one other matrix, rho s of t, so that this relation holds for all A. This rho s of t is called the reduced density matrix of the system. The point is that in the top line here, I involve elements of the system and the reservoir Hilbert space, if you wish, universe, okay? Because this guy acts in this big Hilbert space HS tensor HR. But in the right hand side, or in the side down here, it only involves quantities of the system alone. I have reduced my view to the system alone. Okay? And everything is encoded in this new object here, which, as I said, is called a reduced density matrix of the system. For example, if you deal with a qubit, then this A would be a qubit observable, a two by two matrix. This row would have the same size, it would be a two by two matrix. And so if I multiply these two matrices, I get a two by two matrix, and then I have to take the trace. Trace means sum up the diagonals, and I get a number, and this number is the average of the system observable in this state, okay? And this happens for each moment in time, and so you get here an evolution of the reduced density matrix. And the question is, what kind of equation is it that sends uh, rho s at time zero to rho s at time t? That's reduced dynamics. Okay, very complicated diagram, no. Now, the point is that such a map does not exist, so let me explain. You see, what the system is at time t does not only depend what it was at time zero, but it also depends how it was interrelated with the reservoir at time zero. That's a big problem. Here's this diagram should um, sort of explain this. Suppose I have a system of the whole universe, sorry, a state of the whole universe, state number one at time zero of the system plus reservoir. It's kind of bluish here. And I have another one, the yellow guy. It's the second state of system and reservoir at time zero. And these, these guys can very well lead to the same reduction of the system state alone. In other words, I can have different states here that lead to the same row. Because what I do in this step, I reduce my view to the small system. And so it's like in probability theory, taking marginals of a joint probability distribution, different probability distributions, joint distributions can have the same marginals. When you take marginals or when you reduce to the small system, 
you get rid of correlations and you don't see them anymore. So that's the problem. Two guys here of the universe, two states, can give the same small system initial state. But of course, because they're not the same, globally they will evolve at time t to different vectors of the whole universe, system and reservoir. Okay? And so if I reduce that and look, what is the system actually at time t here, having originated from this dynamics, it's this blue guy. And if I go this way, I have originated from that state, which seemingly and did have the same uh, initial state, I get at time t a different result. So I cannot make a map that purely depends on the initial state of the system and maps it at time t to the state at time t, because these guys are not equal. And so who should I map to? You don't know. You cannot define such a map. OK? However, this is due to initial co uh, correlations between the system and the reservoir. If initially you are uncorrelated or disentangled, if you wish, if the system reservoir state is of product form, where the system alone is known is in some state and the reservoir is in some different state, you see, this is like times, and it means like you're statistically independent, kind of. If that's the case, then you can define this map because the bad thing from before this thing cannot happen these two things then uh, could not lead to the same row s because there is no correlation the fact that you lead you get to different blobs here is because you have initially correlate correlations so if you don't have initial correlations then you can define a dynamical map which is just as you're used to from differential equations or whatever, it gives you a flow, an initial state or an initial condition gets mapped to its state or whatever it is at time t. Okay? And um, because this map has been obtained in this situation uh, for uh, uncorrelated initial state, because it has been obtained by reducing a big dynamics to a small system, this imprints onto the map some special properties. Properties are called CPTP, completely positive trace preserving maps. Okay, and then if you know a bit about linear algebra, then you can look up a theorem. And this theorem tells you just this, just uh, linear algebra. Any CPTP map has a very specific structure. So any such map can actually be written uh, in this form. This is called the Krauss representation. So any such map coming from a dynamics can be written by a bunch of conjugating with a bunch of operators k, called the Krauss operators. Why is this important? That's merely a structure theorem, but it serves actually for people to design um, systems that they can play with. They can say, okay, let me play, let me, since I know it's of this form, I just try out a few k's, I get an easy system, I do some simulations on it, and let me see what kind of open system dynamics I get. Okay? That's not what I do. I would like to derive the dynamics explicitly from the Schrodinger dynamics, but I'm telling you that in practice this is often used to play with open systems. So what about the, the dependence on time of this dynamical map lambda of t? Okay? Well, because the system and the reservoir, even though initially they're uncorrelated, because right otherwise, remember, you can't even define this map lambda of t, but as soon as they start to interact, they become correlated or entangled. And because of that, it turns out that this map, as a map of t, does not compose like this. It's not, it does, it's not a semigroup, okay? So you cannot propagate initially for 10 seconds and then look at the system and take this as a new initial condition that propagate for another 10 seconds, that would be different than propagating from the beginning to the end for 20 seconds. You cannot compose this like that, these maps. And that's, that's too bad, because this property was correct. Oh, that would be great, because if that was correct, then this would be a, a group or a semi-group. And any such map which has an equality sign here, not the non uh, unequal sign, can be written like an exponential to the power t times some other operator l, which is a generator. And if you knew that your map, which gives the dynamics, was like this, 
that would be fabulous because then you could go look at what L is in your specific model, you know, diagonalize L, for example, and know everything about the dynamics. In fact, you know, the Schrodinger dynamics, for the Schrodinger dynamics, it is e to the i t times Hamiltonian. That is of this form. It is a group. And how do people, you know, do quantum theory when they want to know something about the dynamics? They look at the Hamiltonian. They diagonalize it. So what I mean is they find eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Then they write this propagator e to the i t h in its spectral representation, e to the i t times energy times projections onto wave functions, and then they know everything. So if you have this structure, then you have many tools that you can use to uh, look at the dynamics. Okay. But in general, you don't have this structure because of this correlation. But then you can say, okay, fine. Well, maybe I don't have this structure, but can I approximate my dynamics um, in a way that roughly this dynamics can be written like uh, such a semigroup? And if this can be done, then you say that this semigroup is a Markovian approximation to the true dynamics. Okay? Of course, these wiggly signs here, and that's the crux, you need to say, what does it mean? How well is this approximation? And is this approximation, for example, valid for all times or only for short times or for what systems? What has to be, what has to be satisfied and so on? That's difficult. And that sort of... Um, the research I have been involved in over quite a few years now. Anyway, so if somehow you manage to make sense of this, then you can just say, okay, forget about modular this approximation, my dynamics is given by this semi-group, and so my dynamics, approximated Markovian dynamics, is written like that. Or in differential form, if I just take the derivative of this, you get this equation. And this is the extremely famous Markovian master equation, which is ubiquitous in, quantum, in open quantum theory. And it replaces the Schrodinger equation now for open systems. Okay? And then, again, there is a, a little structure theorem <coughs> which says that, okay, if somebody tells you, all right, assume that this is possible, that I can do that, and remember, this lambda t already had a special structure. It was this CPTP thing. But if or not, if furthermore you say that for each t this is CPTP and it's a group, then if you do a little bit of linear algebra, you figure this out. Then, actually, the generator has to be of a very specific form. It has to be given by an equation like that. Okay, maybe you tell me that's not very specific, but it kind of is, <laughs> um, because it's it's about the, the structure of such an operator. It has uh, Hermes, uh, it has a Hamiltonian part. Necessarily, any operator that does this is a CP generator of a CPTP semigroup um, has a part like this. It's called the Hamiltonian part once again. Namely, it's the commutator with a Hermitian operator. This this symbol means matrix A times matrix rho minus matrix rho times matrix a H. Okay, and then there is another part here, which is called the dissipative part. And it involves certain coefficients and certain what's called jump operators. And the meaning is this. If, if you have a system where this all is absent, for example, all the a's are zero, and you have purely that, then this is exactly the Schrodinger equation. But in systems where you have dissipation, energy loss that doesn't come back, stuff gets radiated out to infinity or something, then you have such terms here, and this leads to Irreversible dynamics, which is not visible in the Schrodinger, uh, in the Schrodinger equation. Okay, and again, now that P if you know that okay, my generator must be like that, you can just cook up ten million uh, different models for let's say even a single qubit, play around with what the gammas are, what the a's are, and see what kind of systems you can create. That's what people do if you go online and check, you know. Uh, uh, Markovian master equation, you, you find thousands of papers. And most of them say, this is my starting point, and now I analyze a specific system by giving specific H's and A's. But to me, that's not what I'm interested in. <laughs> I'm interested in deriving this, not starting off with this, OK? And so there are two questions that 
trouble some mathematical physicists. You see some of them here. You see the inner workings of their brains here. And these questions are, first of all, can one derive the Mercurian master equation rigorously from the full Schrodinger equation? Is this possible? And what does one have to assume? And in what regimes does this hold? And so on. And the second question is, well, what happens if the system and the reservoir are initially correlated? Remember, to get to the Mercurian master equation, you even had to initially assume that the system and the reservoir were uncorrelated. Otherwise, you couldn't define the, the map lambda. And the, the Markovian master equation precisely tells you what lambda is. But what if lambda doesn't exist? What should you do? That's point number two. And so to answer the question one, it's not exactly innocuous because, you know, uh, well, as I said, first of all, you need to, to have uncorrelated initial states. Let's assume that you have a system that it has, is initially uncorrelated. Uh, but then you need uh, to give a precise meaning to this uh, approximation. And as I said, that's not, not easy. And to answer number two, it's even more difficult in a sense because, you know, if you have correlations, then necessarily you can't talk about the system alone. You also have to talk about the reservoir because they're correlated. And so if you want to look at the dynamics, even of the system alone, well, it will depend on what the reservoir does and how they interact. And so really, to analyze this point, you need to co co sort of have a handle on both the system and reservoir dynamics okay and I'm going to give you some answers that I have been working on and uh, actually for quite a few years but some more recent papers are these this is kind of uh, the, the most recent paper on this topic that I have written and it tells you what happens if you have correlations initially um, I will sum up the results there and precursor to this paper are these two papers um, that deal with the general mathematical structure of such uh, of this problem okay all right so let me outline the results of of this line of research okay here's a picture where you have a system see that's the coordinates in space zero around zero you have your small system it's maybe a qubit maybe it's five qubits Maybe it's a qubit register of 10 qubits, whatever. It's located here. And it is in space somewhere because I have to place it somewhere. So, you know, it interacts with everything around it, including the experimenter who wants to read out or manipulate the qubit to do a calculation. Okay? So there is an interaction between the qubit and the radiation or whatever is, is around it. That These are these wiggly lines here. Stuff interacts. And... There is also potentially, if you want, initial correlation. Those are these blue waves here. And you see the correlations, they're kind of uh, typically uh, stronger uh, for the degrees of freedom of the reservoir that lie around close to the, to the system. And then they get weaker as you go further away um, from the system. Okay. And, oh, the reservoir is assumed to be a very, very, very big quantum system. In fact, it's a, supposed to be an infinitely big quantum system. It's, it's um, a thermal quantum field that lives in all of space, infinitely extended quantum field that's in equilibrium at a given temperature uh, that you can choose. Okay? And here is the upshot of what we show. Um, we show two things. The first thing is that the initial system reservoir correlations, so this blue stuff that in, encodes the initial state, um, this will dissipate. These correlations, they will just whoosh, radiate off to infinity. Because the, this can be done because the reservoir is supposed to be infinitely extended. It has no boundary. Okay, so there's no like effect that comes back. So these initial correlations, they're there initially. Then you wait for a while, they become weaker, 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 and then they dissipate away. Of course, they never dissipate totally away, but they become very small. And after they effectively have decayed these correlations, then this Markov approximation that I have mentioned before actually becomes valid at that time. Okay? There's another approximation which is called the Born approximation I'm going to talk about as well. So that's sort of the heuristic picture. So 
how do we write this down in formulas? So we take an open quantum system that is bipartite. So we have here an end-level system. That's like a qubit, but instead of having two, two levels, it can have, when you read it out, it can have n different values. And this is placed in, as I said, um, a bosonic field, a quantum field. Whatever, this is some Hilbert space that people call Fox space. And so that describes functions or wave functions or elements in there describe the, um, the state of the radiation field or the environment. And these uh, elements in here describe the state of the qubit or n bit. Okay? And the interaction is as usual. This there is uh, an operator acting on here alone. I didn't put uh, uh, tensor ones and stuff. There is an operator that measures the energy of the field alone, and then there is some interaction. An interaction operator that couples the two, and this interaction operator has in front of it a coupling constant lambda. This is a number. If this lambda is zero, then um, these two subsystems have just their own energies, and they don't talk to each other. But if lambda is not zero, they interact, and then interesting dynamical processes happen. Okay, and initial states can be taken to be possibly correlated, as I mentioned. And as I also mentioned, um, asymptotically, so when you go very far out in position uh, and you look at your, thermal, at your field, then it's in thermal equilibrium. Not really maybe close by to the, to the small system because there there's correlations and though, so, so the state of being thermal is kind of distorted because of interactions with the, with the system. But far out, um, this reservoir is in equilibrium. Okay, so the Hamiltonians, this is just a fancy way of writing a, a matrix which is diagonal in some basis of the phi's, whatever, and on the diagonal you have energy eigenvalues Ej. And this is a standard field Hamiltonian. Don't worry about this too much if you uh, don't know what this means. And the interaction operator is given by a product like that which acts on both system part and reservoir part. In fact, this, uh, if you're a physicist, precisely describes some things. It describes for you how modes of the electromagnetic field interact with the small system and can excite or de-excite the small system. That's all encoded in a form factor, a function G, and some operator capital G, which is a matrix of the same size as HS. It doesn't matter very much, but this is what precisely this all is. This is a very standard um, open quantum system. It's called the spin boson system, by the way. Okay. Um, there is a notion of equilibrium state. And if you know a bit of statistical mechanics, then you know that for a quantum system with Hamiltonian S, e to the minus beta HS is the Gibbs state or the equilibrium density matrix, beta is the inverse step, one over beta, beta is a number, one over beta is the temperature. And uh, for the field, or for the reservoir, you take what's called the thermodynamic limit, so you make bigger and bigger, bigger, bigger uh, regions where this uh, system lives in, and in the limit you get what's called an equilibrium or KMS state, and it is described by what's called a two-point function that also carries an inverse temperature beta. Just to say that you have an infinitely extended system, which is in equilibrium, with its own free energy at a given temperature. Okay? Um, I introduced these two things because when you look at um, what kind of initial states that are possibly correlated can you look at, well, they are given like this. So you take this uncoupled initial uh, equilibrium state where the system is in its own equilibrium, the reservoir is in its own equilibrium, they don't see it, uh, each other. And then you couple them by applying what's called a quantum channel. That's kind of a map that makes all kinds of interaction in a standard way, in quantum information theory, if you wish, between these two guys. So I can give you some lambda that's physically relevant and will describe the interactions between the system and the reservoir. And the structure of my initial states is always like this. I combine 
I, I, I make my initial two equilibrium states, individual guys, I make them interact, they talk to each other by some map lambda, okay? And, okay, <laughs> I don't know how crazy this sounds, but so, you know, in, in the literature people look at explicit models with explicit um, uh, entangled states and stuff, and just to say that it could be of this form here, that has been looked at in the literature. Okay, and so here is my theorem, written in a non-theorem way, but here is um, what I show. Okay, so again, this is your initial state. It's possibly correlated by this strategy I told you. And then if I take the reduction to the small system, I get this reduced density matrix, which is the state of the small system. And the theorem says, if you take lambda small enough, so there is a constant, so that if lambda is smaller than this constant, then the following happens for all times t. For all times t, the true dynamics of system plus reservoir at time t is given by this right-hand side here. And this right-hand side has three components. It has the first component, which you might call the Markovian dynamics, it has a second green part, which you can call the correlation term. And then it has something you can't tell exactly what it is, but you know it's small in lambda. It happens to be of the order of lambda to the one quarter. What's lambda? Well, remember, maybe, if not, I tell you. Again, this lambda is this coupling constant here. So this theory works if you have a system and the, and the reservoir, and they do interact, yes, but kind of not too strongly. This lambda should be a number that should not be too large. This is perturbation theory. It's really all that people know how to do. <laughs> if you can't solve a, a system explicitly, or maybe numerically, then if you want to do something analytic, all you can do is perturbation theory. This is perturbation theory, which is uniform in time. What this result says is that something happens. You have a perturbation expansion with a remainder that's small, if lambda is small. And it is guaranteed that this term here stays small for all times. It's very difficult to, well, <laughs> it's, it, it is difficult to get, to get results that are uniform in time. You must be able to characterize this remainder for all times. Not that suddenly something can become large or so. Anyway, so the two main parts here are the Markovian part and the correlation part, plus uniformly small remainder. Let's look at, um, this says discussion of the Markovian term. Okay, so again, this is the result of the theorem. The first term is the Markovian term. It's, as you can see, it's of the semigroup form. You take the initial reduced state of the system and you apply the semigroup to it. The semigroup is generated by a generator L. And this generator has the form of, uh, well, because it, it, it generates a CPTP semigroup, it has this uh, specific form, as I told you before, in the formula above. It is, first of all, the commutator with the system Hamiltonian. That will give the dynamics if the system didn't see the reservoir at all. And then there's a correction term, which is proportional to lambda squared. And you can calculate in specific models explicitly what this k is. This k is also known as the Davies generator, which is known from a different theory in open quantum systems. It's called, it's called the, the weak, uh, ultra-weak coupling theory. Okay. Now the point here is, I guess, that this, if you look at the spectrum, if you now wanted to implement what I said, if you want to know what this is, just diagonalize this L and write this as a bunch of e to the i t times eigenvalues and then times eigenvectors. The eigenvalues of L, they look like this. So they are not only real, they can also be complex. They all lie in the left half plane in the complex uh, of the complex plane. And you see, because the real part can be negative, well, if you have here a number which is negative, you can see that as time grows, this drives decay. So irreversible decay is encoded in 
the negative parts of the eigenvalues of this operator L. And the imaginary part, if you think of this as x plus iy, right? Um, iy, y will be the imaginary part, which is this here. Then that gets just oscillation e to the it times y. So the spectrum of this of this operator being not real purely um, has oscillating behavior as well as decaying behavior. Okay. So in this direction, you control decay. In this direction, you control uh, oscillations. Okay. What about the correlation term? Because, I mean, this correlation term can be analyzed in more detail, and it does the following. Okay, so we just discussed, oh, uh, something important that I didn't uh, really say explicitly. This here is the, the equilibrium state of the reservoir alone. So what this says here, <laughs> this term alone, let's say the correlations were not here for, exact, for, for a moment. Then this here says that the system is just evolving according to an easy evolution a semi-group evolution, and the reservoir doesn't do anything. It's just stationary in its equilibrium state. That is what people usually call the Born approximation. Why do they think, why do people think this should happen? It's because the reservoir is huge and the system is small. And so initially the reservoir is almost in equilibrium. It's just maybe a little perturbation of equilibrium. So the reservoir just almost always stays in the equilibrium. It's so lazy and it doesn't care about the system that this should be true. And this usually, this splitting of something happens on the system, system but nothing happens on the reservoir, is an input into heuristic arguments of why the Markovian master equation should be correct. Here, though, it's a proof that this happens, OK? This is called the Born approximation. All right. What about the correlation term? Well, the correlation term has the following properties. Sometimes it's zero. When is it zero? Well, if initially I start off with a, a disentangled state, system and tensor reservoir, and reservoir is in equilibrium, then this correlation term will stay zero always. So if initially I don't have correlations, I will not build up correlations. That's what this says, OK? What this part says. Then this term depends also uh, if I evaluate this term against an observable of the system alone, then um, this term also disappears. So this correlation term really only comes into play if you're interested in observables of system plus reservoir. If you only look at re system observables, that guy doesn't even ever show up either. And furthermore, this term here, this correlation term, it decays in time. It decays polynomial in time. As time goes on, it decays like, well, one over some power of time. Okay? This means, as I said at the beginning, if you have initially correlation and you wait for a while, the correlation dissipates, they go away. Okay, so I have now a few corollaries of, of this result, and, um, and then I'm sort of done with my presentation. I had prepared an application to so something in um, quantum chemistry, but um, because I have so many words to say, I don't have enough time, and we will skip that. But anyway, here are some corollaries. First corollary of this theorem is that the Markovian approximation is valid for all times. Oh, this is when you start initially uncorrelated, okay? This should be uh, lambda of t. This is an upside down lambda, right? Sorry for that. But the dynamical map is approximated by this semi-group for all times, uniformly in time, by a term which is small in the interaction. This was not proved before. It was proved in a special setting before in the weak coupling limit of Davis. And this is, of course, heuristically believed to be true in all physics textbooks. Okay? But you cannot find a proof, a uh, rigorous proof of that. <clears throat> OK. Um, the second corollary is that the Born approximation is valid for all times. In fact, this is correct, that the system reservoir dynamic stays like this, uncorrelated for all times, except this guy starts getting time dependent, but this guy doesn't care. OK? 
Corollaries for initially correlated states of system and reservoir. Well, the Markov approximation for the system is still correct. Okay? Namely, if I take if, if this is the full state once again and this is the reduced state of the system alone, then it's still correct that the <laughs> the, the state, the true system state is approximated by the semigroup for all times. Initial correlations, possible initial correlations, are just encoded in this initial condition if they're there. Or another way, another way of saying is that at the beginning I told you, in principle, it's not correct to, to, uh, that you can um, define such a map, lambda, that um, pushes your initial system state to a final system state because of initial correlations. Here I'm telling you, actually, this can be done. And this can be done up to order lambda squared in these models. So this is a proof that, if you wish, that it is actually not silly to start off with uncorrelated, uh, uh, it's, it, that you can define the dynamical map, even if you have any correlations in these models, up to an order lambda, uh, lambda to the power one quarter cor correction. OK. So um, the final corollary is this. Look, this is the expansion. At time equals 0, um, this here is just 1. Uh, so whatever. And then I, if I solve for, for chi, if you wish, well, the, uh, the correlation term is the difference of this minus this plus a remainder. Okay. So at time equals 0, if the initial state you choose is not of product form, well, then this chi is large, of course, okay? Because this difference will be large. So obviously, for small times, the Born approximation is wrong. There are correlations. This is not at all equal to that, okay? But as I said in, ab above, this chi decays polynomially in time because of this, the dispersiveness of the reservoir alone. This has nothing to do with the small system. It's just a property, really, of the reservoir. So this is decays polynomially. And after this has decayed, then you enter uh, the Markovian regime, because then this term is kind of small. Initially, it might have been big, because you chose an initial condition that has a lot of correlation. But once this is gone, then this guy takes over, and you enter the Markovian regime. Well, what if you, OK, so so. So this is the Markovian term. This is the correlation term. What if you compare them? Um, this behaves. Um, so this, as I explained before, this has sort of decaying directions as well, right? Because of this imaginary part, uh, sorry, because of the real part of the spectrum of this operator. But this is all due to the interaction with the reservoir. You wouldn't have any decay if the system didn't interact with the reservoir. So all this decay would not be there if lambda is 0. So actually, this stuff decays like e to the minus lambda squared t. And whatever stays over after stuff has decayed okay, um, is actually the uncoupled equilibrium state, because the small system is going to be thermalized, because it was in contact with this big thermal reservoir. But this happens at exponentially fast or slowly at, uh, at a uh, with a decay time 1 over lambda squared. You see, if your interaction is very small, then 1 over lambda squared is huge. And this happens very slowly. That's what I picked, uh, depicted here. For a very small coupling, this term does almost not decay. Yeah, it decays exponentially, but with an exponent which is extremely small. While the uh, correlation term decays independently of the interaction strength like a polynomial. So eventually, the correlation term, maybe at the beginning it was big, but it decays quicker than the exponential term. And so eventually, when, uh, when the, this guy goes underneath, the Mercoian term is dominant, and you have entered from the correlation regime, you have entered the Mercoian regime. Okay? And so now, <coughs> oops, I'm going to skip this. I didn't know how much time I would have, really. And I want to tell you about Les in Afrikaans, Hilaire and ChatGPT. 
because after this walk, remember the kind of the highlight of the talk was the picture of the mountain there. At the beginning, after this talk, we went to for lunch, and um, I had the pleasure to sit next to a prominent person, no names shall be named, in the group of Francescos. And I have learned that this prominent person <coughs> termed, uh, coined a term in Afrikaans, and this term is the Wabis. And so, of course, I went yesterday on to ChatGPT, and I had the following conversation with ChatGPT. I asked, okay, I'm, I will tell you, this was me. I asked ChatGPT, translate to Afrikaans qubit. And then stupid ChatGPT goes, qubit. But I remember that lunch, that person who invented the name told me something else. So <laughs> I said to ChatGPT, well, what is then a quabit? <laughs> because I didn't exactly remember. <laughs> and then ChatGPT tells me, oh, apologies for the mistake. Quibit is not correct. Uh, it is actually a quantum bit. And then I remembered, ah, I think it was it. So I, so I asked ChatGPT, is it not actually quabis? And then ChatGPT, after making many, many mistakes, um, said, oh, uh, it's correct. Again, uh, apologizing that Quabis is the right term for qubit. So don't trust ChatGPT or AI. Be yourself. <laughs> OK, thank you very much for your attention. Marco, thank you very much for the very nice talk. So we'll sleep very well tonight because we learned that what physicists assume to be true is actually true. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> so are there questions for, for Marco? Let's start maybe from the, uh, mm, sorry, from the people in the, uh, that are physically present, sorry. Uh, uh, Zurab, yeah. And then we move on to questions from the online audience. Um, I apologize if this question will turn out to be a stupid question. Um, be yourself. <laughs> in, in the calculations that lead to the proofs of the results that you presented, to what extent you're making use of the full power of complex numbers? Could this have been Hilbert spaces over an arbitrary field? Oh, an arbitrary field. Well, I, I don't know. I only know reals and complex. <laughs> no, 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 no. It is, it is very, very crucial that you have complex analysis. In fact, oh, the complex analysis plays a huge role in the way of how you represent the propagator, this unitary group e to the ith. This can be represented using some path integrals around the spectrum of h which, okay, spectrum of H, because this H is uh, uh, Hermitian, is on the real line, actually. But you need to, you, you use um, representations. You use kind of the Fourier transform of this thing, the Fourier Laplace transform of this thing, represent this uh, in complex, in the complex plane with path integrals. So you, you use a lot of material from complex yes. analysis. Yes, a crucial, totally okay. crucial. Ah, here there's a question. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, Marco. Um, I had a couple of questions. One of them was about the initial state on the slide where you had the initial state preparation with the initial correlated state. You, you define the map. Yes, this one. So, um, so I, I guess I had kind of two sub questions in this. My first one was if you're just given a state rho of SR, some mm -hmm. state that has some correlations or entanglement, is it always possible to come up with a yeah. map in which you, you can start from this initially or uncorrelated state? Because I yeah. imagine that for, yeah. for any reservoir state, this is possible, but if you restrict yourself to thermal states. No. Oh, OK, good question. So, so I, I, I didn't go into the details of, you know, <sighs> what kind of class of initial states I can actually deal with, right? So yes, they're constructed like this. And then the question is, 
what kind of case can you allow? Uh, uh, because the case, you know, there's lots of technical details that you have to, you know, unbounded operators, domains, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's complicated. Um, and the set of states um, that I can get, I would say, is a dense set in the set of all uh, system reservoir possible states. Okay. Because you can vary over humongously general classes of case. That's why I gave this example. You see, one such K could be something like this. I mean, I don't know if th this means anything to you, but I could take the exponential of some operator E, and this E could look like this. So these A and A daggers, okay, they're linear here in A and A dagger, but they're not bounded operators. Mm -hmm. They have a physical meaning. And so you can have hugely unbounded operators and products of such things and sums of such, such things. And if you put that all together, you get a dense class okay. of, of states. Okay, so there's like a general, in, generally this can be defined, this map lambda, like for a lot. This, this is my assumption. My yeah. assumption is that, sorry, this lambda is not the, is not the dynamical map. Yeah, I know, it's the... In tank, this, this map is for me telling me how can I, what kind of initial states can I produce? Uh, and they have to be, the lambda is really taking, uh, acti doing this, right? Yeah. yeah, because what I was going to, my kind of second sub-question there was, you can kind of view this lambda as like, well, okay, in this equation, you can, assuming that the, the inverse of this map exists, you can take it over to the other side, and then you can view this as kind of like a decorrelation map. Ah. Oof. And then what you're saying is kind of your dynamics, you're effectively starting from a decorrelated state, applying the inverse of this map lambda to do one kind of time evolution. And then on top of that, you're doing another time evolution, which is in the actual dynamics, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, that could so it's kind of make like sense. You, you're, you're combining two maps. One's like a decorrelation. Yes, yes. Assuming that the inverse of that lambda exists. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, I agree. Yes. Yeah. Would exist here, for example. Yes. OK. And then the, the second question I had was about the, um, well, you had the correlation term on a few on a, if you go forward a few slides, I think you had a decorrelation to uh, this one, yeah. So you had like a l an upper bound for this yes. magnitude. Yes. So here, this is just written as one plus t squared. Is there any um, correlation? I guess in this, this is this written in units of a correlation time, or is there any kind of correlation time that appears in this? That is a very Difficult question. I imagine I, yeah, it would depend on everything. Because this has a, a unit, you mean? Yeah, because I mean, if you could identify a correlation time, but I imagine that this depends on everything that goes into the, like, it depends on the map lambda, it depends on the temperature. I, I don't, frankly, I don't know the answer to that. Of course, this, I guess, should be unitless or something. But I will say something else in, interesting about that just quickly. Okay, <laughs> I yeah, don't know yeah. the answer. But, I want to, but yeah. why, is it, why is it precisely this power? It doesn't have to be precisely this power. This is just um, sort of the smoother the objects are that you look at. You know, the, there's these coupling functions and these operators that, that correlate uh, the system at the reservoir. There's some notion of smoothness. And the smoother they are, the quicker you can show that this decays. And this is sort of the roughest that I can deal with because I want to be able to deal with kind of rough interactions and rough initial states. And for this all to work, this is the roughest, and so this is the slowest decay that I can get. In fact, it, in other methods that I have investigated before, um, stuff can, correlations can be shown to decrease exponentially quickly. Mm. But for that, you need extremely smooth Hamiltonians, okay? And if you don't want that, then you pay the price and you might have slower decay. Okay, okay, thank you. Any more questions from the audience here? Are there any questions, Rene, from the people online? No? Okay, then, Marco, it is my final pleasure what? to <laughs> give you <laughs> a little thank you from oh, all th of us. This it's is too much, Francesco. <laughs> thank you very much. Publication of NITEX that you can read <laughs> on your flight back home. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. <laughs>